for meta devices, please get off now. <laughs> so I, 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 I cracked that joke because I, I have a very helpful space bar pusher back here at Susan, and I'd like to thank her for her time and effort. She is here today because the TSA dropped my laptop. Uh, it's destroyed the battery near the uh, backlight on the LCD, so my laptop won't be doing any presenting anytime soon. Uh, but at least the terrorists didn't win. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they beat my laptop. <laughs> My laptop is now a casualty of the global war on terror. Yes, so it's friendly fire. <laughs> yeah, that's not good. So anyway, over the last few weeks, uh, I am the community manager for Xenos. My name is Andrew Kirch. Did they reimburse you for that damage? Uh, this was my personal laptop, so no, I didn't want to take my work laptop because it's brand new. And I don't trust the TSA. One of the TSA, they reimburse you for the It's the United States government. Number five, 2013. <laughs> You're lucky to get a tax free. Saturday, 4 p.m. Monitoring embedded devices. I'm not real happy about it, but life goes on. Go to the site and file a complaint. Seriously. I'm, and, and like I opened the bag, there's a TSA uh, inspected your, your laptop thing, and the battery shattered, and the screen doesn't work. Wow. Problem is, I got to prove it was them. They put their sticker on it. They did, didn't they? We had it still probably not going to be good enough for a quarter block. Sanford's good enough. I'll pull the money out of the FBI. Uh, they, they owe me anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we want to do a talk on this after this on Cybercrime. I'm happy to do that with this well. <laughs> anyway, monitoring embedded devices. Uh, I'm the community manager at Xenos, and that it's a little bit sex. I'm not like the world's best coder, but I do tend to kind of keep people that need things from us uh, fairly happy, you know, as happy as can be expected. Uh, and talking to one of the guys in the community, Shane Scott, who is just an absolute ninja with our product, we started discussing you know, what would be cool to show people that Xenos hasn't really done before, what would be something that's emerging that, that's awesome. Uh, the first two things that came to mind were uh, Arduino and Raspberry Pi, click. Oh, there we go. So what we're going to cover, I'll talk a little bit about Xenos, the company. Um, we're going to basically discuss the building blocks of how to get from absolutely nothing, from where this gentleman is where, with his project, to something that speaks Ethernet and can be monitored via SNMP. We're going to discuss the structures of SNMP. I'm going to show you how to uh, write a custom data source in both Arduino and how to do it very easily with that SNMP on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the Raspberry Pi is very cool because you can extend it with Bash. So very simple to pull just about anything you want out of it. Uh, next slide. There we go. So anyway, we've been around for a while. Xenos was created in 2005. All my bullet points on this slide conveniently disappeared. Uh, Xenos is open source, that's important to know. You can download the, the source code and the software itself. And it can also be hacked on and extended. We have an interface, and this is what kind of makes this talk useful called Zenpacks. And what Zenpacks do is allow you to monitor practically anything. And if it doesn't support it, if you've got the SNMP nib that we're going to talk about, you can come up with a Zenpack in a couple of hours that will comprehensively monitor your temperature and humidity and uh, soil temperature sensors. Um, the status of digital inputs and outputs on your Raspberry Pi and any variable that the operating system happens to be able to hand off the bash. Uh, none of this is going to require heavy lifting in C. Uh, this probably will be the most advanced talk on our dream of they'll have this show. Next slide. So SNMP is what has been used for a couple of decades to connect uh, performance data and monitoring information on networked hardware, servers, routers, UPSs, stuff you find in racks in the data center, and connect that <coughs> to a collector, which can then use that data to do something useful. Uh, all it is is a, manner, is a method of passing variables uh, across a network. In, sometimes a secure manner and often in plain text. 
the two yeah, major, the first person who used the word secure and SNMP in the same sentence. SNMPv3 is secure. SNMPv3 is the largest nightmare in the history of man to set up. <laughs> we do have a document on doing it. The document's bad enough, it makes my head work to read it. <laughs> um, if you use SNMPv3, if you use the AES encryption and the full session management, it is rock solid secure. It's just like SSL. Okay, get back, getting back into cybercrime, I know a few things, this is all going to be secure, but that's it, let's move on. Don't use your credit card on eBay. Um, <laughs> SNMP, there's two things in SNMP that, that, that are like the, the master terms. You, you have two things, you have a MIP, which is the man, management information base. What the management information base is, is a semi-human readable and machine readable file that has information on, on object IDs or OIDs. OIDs are essentially your variables that you're passing via SNMP, and they are recursive. They're, they're tree structured and, and they, they, they recurse. So you can have a whole bunch of OIDs, you can, you can branch out. Um, the, the structure of that tree is up to the person that is creating the tree, unless it's one of the RFC defined MIP trees. Uh, OIDs are object identifiers. Right, forget object identifiers, it's a variable. And it even tells you what kind of variable it is. Next slide. There are only a couple of type of variables that you really care about. I've got like 10 listed here. Let me go over the ones that you care about. Uh, integer, you're sending a number. String, you're sending a string of text. Um, and, and counters. Counters are the only time you're ever going to see counters. You're probably never use them for your project. But if you ever want to monitor anything else, especially routers and switches, the interface traffic is represented in a 32-bit counter. It spools all the way out, then wraps around, spools all the way up again, then wraps around, and that's how it can keep track of huge amounts of traffic. So when you when you query it, you get a number. When you query it five minutes later, you get another number. You subtract A from B. You know how much traffic has passed in the last five minutes. That's where you're mostly going to see counters. I can't think of an R case scenario where you might use a counter, but you will run into them elsewhere in the wild. So just so that it, you're going to see that. Uh, time ticks is the only other one I'll bring up. Time ticks are how SNMP measures uptime. So time since last reboot, or anything that is just going to increment off into a bidding. Uh, Arduino users pay attention here. The largest variable you can store is 32 bits. It's in microseconds. It ends up wrapping about once every 50 days. Yes? I thought there's eight byte counters, but only four bit integers. Four byte integers. You're asking a reasonable question, and the answer is because the people that created SNMP hate us. Uh, SNMP is a very old protocol. It was designed to work on older hardware. I'm not sure why they went that direction, but I'm assuming there's a limitation of the hardware that was available at the time. We're talking the 1980s. It seems like if they could do it now, they could do it in your head today. I am not going to disagree with you. I, I have not researched the history of SNMP that in depth. Okay. I, it's a very good question, but I'm assuming, based on history, especially with things like ancient routers, if you look even at the, at the processors in the Cisco 2600, it's uh, it's not even equivalent to what's in an Arduino now. Uh, next slide. Okay, wonderful. We're screen wrapping this. Um, the Auto Linux system, uh, when you're wanting to check your work, there's a couple of commands that you're going to use. SMP walk will list every OID in your on the on the machine in order. I'm going to give you a warning now, and I'll reiterate it later. Do not SNMP walk in Arduino. You will die. Uh, it will die a horrible death, and then it won't do anything. Um, for an Arduino, and let's walk through that command here real quick. Yeah, you have one more thing in SNMP called the community. If you pull, uh, community is a very primitive password. If you pull a machine and use the wrong community name. You're not going to get anything back. Since the community is set in plain text, five minutes with TCP, you're going to know the community name for everything on the network. It's not really secure, but you still have to specify it. So SNMP hyphen C 
Xenos, which is the community name for that machine. V2C is one of the three revisions of SMMP you'll see in the world. Version 1, version 2C, and version 3. Um, SNMP GET is just like SNMP WALK, but instead of trying to walk the whole machine, you will only be requesting one OID. Um, OIDs are a series of numbers uh, separated by decimal points as they're represented. And almost all of them are going to start with 1361, and then either 2 or 4. 2 is what comes out of uh, an RFC standard. Four is if you go to IANA and say, hey, I've got this project, I need to do a custom MIB, I need my own enterprise organization. So if you're Cisco, you're going to go to IANA and say, hey, I need this. It's a very simple form to fill out. I've got one, I've had it for years, and I've never used it until I wrote this talk. Next slide. So this is our Arduino code, and the top line is comment, so it's not a huge deal that we can't see it. Uh, this, is using a, this is using a framework called Agent Duino. And what you've got here is you're, you're going to set a variable, static characters here, you're setting a variable, syspump state, and it's equal to the OID. So we're going to come in here later and say, hey, this is, so we're wanting syspump state. This is read only, so we're not doing anything with write. We're sending an error read only on that variable. Now, when you want to actually send data, this is where it gets interesting. So you respond with uh, the integer syntax. You're, you're saying, hey, this is, a, this is an integer. And then the variable from your C code in Arduino, any variable that you want that's already defined, when you get to here, you can pass as the final argument and the value of your void back to your collector. So what that means is any variable that you've created in Arduino anywhere can be sent back via SNMP, so it's incredibly flexible. So if you want to know the status of the vents on the greenhouse, if you want to know the status of you know, a, a hydroponic pump, if you want to know the temperature, if you want to know the humidity, and, and I say this only because he's very close to one of the projects that I'm writing, um, it will be able to export every one of those, and then later when you build your Z pack, you can graph all of those or set alerts, thresholds, etc., with Xenos, and actually have environmental monitoring. So not only are you using these these variables in your code, you can come out and have them externally checked. Any questions on Arduino as we're through here? Next slide. So we define the OID, we pass it in a variable. So here's what that response looks like. As I, you know, we, we were telling Arduino, hey, this is an integer, and the integer has a value. I'm actually monitoring the pin that's connected to a re, uh, fairly chunky relay that is switching on a DC pump. The pump runs for a certain amount of time and then shuts off. So I, I have shown here with the pump on, Arduino's uh, SNMP V1. Uh, community public, IP address, please don't have my internal network, uh, and the OID. So uh, again, you have a really long number here. Now we've added some stuff to the end of the OID as I do this and try to not block myself. I cheated here and used 8072. The reason why I did that is 8072 is actually set aside by the RFCs for embedded devices. Uh, that's useful later because it allows me to use the same MIB on a Raspberry Pi as I'm using on an Arduino, because that SNMP will not let you use pass on an OI, on a uh, on a uh, enterprise number that's not the embedded pass is specifically designed in that SNMP and required by RFC to only be used in the embedded uh, portion of the MIP table, which is uh, 8072. And as I said, this is just a simple integer. Uh, it's literally the status of the pump. You know, I, I would go into our RD tool and say, hey, add a thousand to this so that you know, I can actually see it in a chart. Um, as I noted earlier, it's a 12 megahertz or, or with the new chips, the 32 U4s, it's a 16 megahertz Arduino. It's not a Linux box. You can't beat on it. You have to kind of uh, be a little bit kind to it. Don't SNMP walk it. Great limit your polling. Um, 
don't run the thing out of RAM, you'll have uh, embedded controller that will just crash on you. Um, Agent Duino debugging. Um, Agent Duino uh, has a debug functionality that returns some information to the console on available free memory. Uh, so can anybody tell me how many kilobytes of active RAM there are there is on an Arduino? On the 32U4, yes. On most Arduinos, there's two. What's really cool with this on the older Arduinos is it will return there's about 960 bytes of RAM free. The next time through, it will return that there's four bytes of RAM free exactly, and then it will never return a value again. So the debugging uh, is of limited use, at least in my experience. I just went ahead and turned it off and saved a whole bunch of money because it's not loading uh, those libraries. Um, well, he's walking through the music that I'm by myself. Next slide, please. And, and, and when I say 12 megahertz Arduino, the new Arduinos, unfortunately, not the Arduinos they used on the uh, Ethernet Arduino, because I really wish they'd used the 32U4. But uh, they are 16 megahertz. They do have 4K RAM, which is amazing. Um, so, Raspberry Pi. Cool thing about Raspberry Pi, it's Linux. Anything you do on Raspberry Pi, you can do on any other Linux machine. So when I say Raspberry Pi up here, think, hey, I have this thing on this Linux machine I want to monitor and don't know how to do it. Here's a really easy way to extend that SNMP to monitor anything that you might be able to get into a variable in Bash. Um, this is the net SNMP pass function. So this is the entire, for this test, this is the entire SNMP decom file. As, as you so well point out, SNMP isn't secure, don't bother. Um, so we set up a community, remember in our, in our, in our string, we, we have hyphen C and the community name. Um, we, I've got two variables here, I'm only going to use, I've got two words here, I'm only going to use the top one. And in, in this case, it's an integer. If you wanted to pass a string, integer is string, echo something that's not a number. Um, this is what your OID is going to return. If you, if you remember, you get a return of the OID number, what kind of OID it is, what the number is, and exit. Um, on the Raspi, because it's got analog pins, it is uh, very easy to query those. Uh, it's in sysclass GPIO, GPIO at N, which is whatever the value is in your GPIO, 22, 23, 24, commonly used. And that will give you either a 0 or a 1, 0 off or on, for that pin. Uh, this allows you to determine the state of various pins on the, on the Raspberry Pi, pretty much on the fly remotely. Uh, next slide. Go! So you remember, as I said, we return three things. We return the OID, we return the integer, that it's an integer, and we return the number. It looks exactly like what that shell script was going to spit out on each line. And that SNMP just takes that response and spins it back to the host that's querying it. Um, one caveat, the one way you can really kind of screw yourself up, those scripts need to have execute permission. So if they don't have execute permission, you're going to get a no such value in this MIB error from the machine that you're querying from. If you see that much, if you see that error CH mod 700 in the script, you're good to go. Um, the resources slide has a larger example. I don't have the resources slide fully filled out, but this one is here. NetSNMP has a more complex shell script. They can explain to you how to return multiple OID values of multiple types in one shell script, so you don't have to have 18 more OID shell scripts to monitor what you're trying to do. It makes it a lot easier. Uh, next slide. And, and, and seriously, again, a ser serious thank you to Susan for uh, hitting the space bar when requested. Um, so we discussed that these lines are really long and ugly. you got all these numbers and decimal points, and it's a pain. Uh, with that, what you end up with is something that's hard for us to read. It's hard even for another computer to read. So the solution to that is a MIP. Before you install the MIB, you have this really nasty thing. After that, you have something that's a little bit more readable. It's that SNMP MIB, that SNMP module ID, integer, and the integer. Um, 
if you're running Ubuntu on the machine that you're using to query, or if you're running Ubuntu on the Raspberry Pi, there is an estimate. They don't ship the MIBs with the standard MIBs with uh, Ubuntu's SNMP or with Debian's SNMP. There's an SNMP MIB download. You need to download that onto both sides, or you're going to get a whole bunch of uh, unknown IDs and, uh, and other errors, and these will leave you pretty well high and dry. So go find that uh, SNMP MIB file, it downloads them automatically. Uh, on the Raspberry Pi, it does like to stick those MIBs in temp for copies of where they're supposed to go. That does occasionally fill temp, unmount temp, install uh, the package, reboot the Raspberry Pi, you're good to go. Next slide. All right, you remember when I said there would be a lot of errors and a lot of things scrolling from MIBs that aren't included? This is the beginning of the MIB that we use to transform those variables. Uh, these are what were imported. Uh, things like, hey, it's, it's an integer. Hey, we have SNMP2. The standard SNMP framework MIB, we're pulling in strings. So we have strings and integers. And obviously, that SNMP because we're running that SNMP. Uh, this is just the machine code to make a MIB that turns this stuff into being human readable. Next slide. So we need to tell the system who we are and why we're writing this MIB because it would make sense. Many different projects might use the SNMP embedded uh, OIDs. So we need to tell it that, hey, we're Xenosync and Steelhouse and this is what this MIB does. So that we have, you know, when it was created, who created it, how to get a hold of them, and what the MIB does. This is very useful, A, for keeping your MIBs organized on your system, B, for knowing what the this MIB is three years later when we come across it. I've had a few years since then. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is where we define a couple of these object types, the object identifiers. So, example string, example int. We used int, and you remember the last number, the oid was one, and we basically just tell it one there. So, 8072.3, which is what we specify in the, in the org, dot one. All you're doing is telling it what each number is past your enterprise ID in the MIB, and you can also tell it through some more advanced syntax, hey, there may be more than one pump, hey, there may be more than one thermostat, whole dot one dot one, dot one dot two, dot one dot three, pass this because you're going to find more values. And this is the end of the MIB, so all you have to do is tell it end. So this is about, uh, between those slides, about 25 lines, and it tells you everything you need to know, uh, everything the machine needs to know to easily monitor this in any network monitoring system, not Geos, Xenos, uh, Oxview, um, oh, Zabbix, uh, but you're going to want to use Xenos, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> you're not biased at all. No, I, I am totally non-biased. I, I, I have no opinion as to which network monitor software is better, <laughs> but you're going to want to use Xenos. Um, Good to get a non-biased opinion. Exactly. Uh, next slide. Pay no attention to the Xenos at the bottom of the slides. <laughs> All right, here's a couple of resources that are useful. Wikipedia has a better than fantastic article on SNMP. I know that's a really long URL. If you go to Wikipedia and just put SNMP in the search, fantastic article. Uh, much more in depth than even this talk was. Uh, you'll learn a little bit more about how to extend it how to use some of the other variable types that you might come across and want to use. Um, the, the IANA Enterprise application, as I said, if you're driving a whole custom MIB, you decide to become a commercial customer and sell a million Arduino-based solutions to people. You're going to want one of those enterprise applications so that people aren't tripping over your ones. So somebody doesn't play Cisco, doesn't come back later, and reuse the same object identifiers that you use in Embedded, and leave you high and dry. Uh, that SNMP pass, that SNMP has usually horrific documentation. Their documentation that SNMP pass is no better. Their shell script on that SNMP pass is a great framework to build something that can respond to multiple void requests. Um, 
as I said, if you run to an SMMP, uh, Debian requires SMMP MIPS downloader. And from here, what you can do, as I said, the, the, the Xenos portion of this, we do have the ability to do custom SMMP zip packs. Uh, they're written in Python. They aren't horribly painful. Um, the first one that you write will be a little bit painful, but it allows you to expand both our uh, user environment, so the UI can be changed and modified. It will also allow you to uh, set custom thresholds, create custom graphs, uh, extend our RD tool and functionality that we don't normally have, things of that nature that are going to benefit you as you really get in depth on monitoring your software. And since Xenos is open source, the, the interfaces to this are open source, you can open source and use whatever license you want for this impact. Next slide. Questions? <laughs> Trying to do a fairly thorough job of covering, so are there questions? Answers, anything I should have added? <laughs> yes? So a while ago, I had an SNMP set up in a data center, and then the other data set administrator said, you've got to turn yours off, it's interfering with ours. Does that make any sense to you that there would be like a competing SNMP type environment? The only thing I think you could have done to compete with theirs is if possibly you deleted their community streams from the snmpd.com. I, I don't see how that's possible. The only other thing I can think is possibly congestion. SNMP is noisy. Lots of little packets. I, I, they could be writing different variables. It, yeah, you could have a, a situation like I just described where you had two MIP tables play, where you're sending one set of variables on uh, an, an OID uh, for your MIP, and they're expecting something else for their MIP. That's another good reason why you get the IAM and Enterprise MIP. Because this is yours. Anybody else that uses it is clearly wrong, and you can kick them. <laughs> I believe that's the extent of the enforcement that I am on you. Yes? Uh, the Raspberry Pi, you mentioned uh, reading from digital input on it. Um, does it actually have the ability to read an analog signal directly? I thought you needed additional hardware on a Raspberry Pi. You do. do. Now, what, let's go back to the BeagleBone. Yes, oh, I'm that's the next question. Yes, you can query the ADCs on the BeagleBone. My recommendation of it is pull that multiple times and take an average in that batch for the return. <laughs> Like by take, pull that analog port one, two, three, four, five times, return that as, as an average. Uh, you can even do complex math. I wrote, if you look on GitHub for the Aquaponics project, I wrote a uh, bash script in BC to convert the analog voltage of a 10K thermistor that's plugged into a little Beagle bone into temperature Fahrenheit, temperature Celsius. So you can even do that in your batch script and return a temperature instead of the voltage. You can parse that as much as batch as you're capable of doing. Both of these, I, you should really get to this, both of these are very extensible solutions. What is the graphic? Uh, I, I'm not that familiar with Xenos. Uh, is there any unique functionality for like, seeing these outputs over time? Yes. Uh, there's, there, there, let's go through the history of graphics software real quick. It, it, it's cool. Uh, we started out with an app that I believe Paul Bixon wrote called, uh, called MRTG. MRTG was horrible, ugly, and wrote graphs that were horribler and uglier. They, they were so bad I'm actually butchering the English language to illustrate the horror <laughs> of MRTG. Uh, Tobias Odeker wrote RRD tool. It is somewhat less ugly and somewhat less uh, that said, the learning curve on our RD tool is like running into that wall as fast as you possibly can. I have a solution to that, that's why I bring this up. There are, if you look for an RRD file generator, there are some online. Kind of throw variables out, see what you get out in the RRD file. It'll take you about three or four tries before you understand, okay, this is what this variable does, this is what this variable does, and you can just write the RRDs yourself. It's real simple. Um, I've also got in the same aquaponics project a sensors.sh that has a lot of RRD stuff in it. And it creates multiple RRD graphs based on the Beagle Line. More questions? Rotten fruit, rotten vegetables. <laughs> Our golf balls. Golf or ping pong? Uh, egg. Egg. Oh. All right, we're not going egg. 
Thanks. <laughs> I, I don't have my protective eyewear to the car. Bye. Um, thank you to Susan for deft spacebar clicking. And a moment of silence, please, for my laptop, which gave its life in the world. <laughs> thank you all for coming. If you have any other questions, let me know.